Our first keynote of the day will be David Long. He is the founder and the president of Vitec Corporation and the president, he was the president of Incos International 2014 and 15. He will present a keynote on the topic evolving model-based systems engineering to enable the digital future. Now, in the systems engineering of today, the term model-based systems engineering is very common, very prevalent. Some people think this is a tool, it's a new tool. And the answer is, not really. As long as there's been engineering, there have been models. But 50 years ago, it was text on a piece of paper or a drawing on an A0 sheet. Those are very primitive models. What we're talking about today is an executable software model. That's not news, it's not contentious, but the question is, have we now reached our end objective with tools like that? What are the challenges of today and tomorrow? And that's what David is going to be talking about. The issue is systems engineering doesn't live on its own. It's got a context. There are other engineering processes. All the LETs are there, like reliability, maintainability, electromagnetic compact, you name it. All of those should be integrated into the new tools, and that's what David calls the digital future and digital engineering. David walks in some big shoes. His late father, James Long, who started Vitec, spoke at the first INCO South Africa conference in 2013. He has presented tutorial at this conference in 2012, 2014, 2016, and again in 2018. These tutorials have proven very worthwhile and insightful. I strongly recommend them. At Vitec, he leads a team in delivering innovative industry-leading methods and software, particularly Core and Genesis, to help companies engineer next-generation systems. He's also an ESEP, that stands for an expert systems engineering professional. He frequently delivers keynotes and tutorials around the globe, and that's why we invited him. Please, David. Thank you, Ad. And I guess for, for presence, I can use this if I need to make a point. So I, I have to believe that half of you are thinking, wonderful, we get to start the day with model-based systems engineering. And the other half of you are thinking, dear Lord, anything but more model-based systems engineering. It's not an official and cozy conference if there's not model-based content. So add this clears that checkbox and there's no more for the rest of the conference, right? No, there's probably a little. Keep on dreaming, keep on dreaming. Uh, I always like to level set. How many people in the audience consider themselves an expert in model-based systems engineering? Why is it no hands ever go up? Oh, there's, all right. People are generally afraid that I'm gonna call on them. How many, of, how many of you are model-based practitioners? Model-based aware? You can spell model-based, you can spell MBSC. Okay. We're, we're good. It, it should be a, a message for everyone here in the room. So let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, there was systems engineering, and there was the V model, and it was good. And then we had the age of digitalization, the digital revolution, where we have unprecedented computing power and computing storage, thanks to Moore's Law, the doubling every 18 months. And so we had the advent of computer-aided systems engineering, much like computer-aided everything else. And we brought those together, and we had model-based systems engineering, and it was good. And in fact, for the last 16 years, systems engineering has been focused in this area. For the last eight years, I would tell you that we have been obsessed in this area. And for the last five years, Incozi has had an objective to transform systems engineering to a model-based discipline. Now, that actually doesn't mean what most people think it means. The reason I know this is I was the one who wrote the objective. I was the president at the time. Most people focus on the model-based. I focus on the discipline and the role that model-based could have in enabling systems engineering to mature as a discipline. But that's, that's neither here nor there. We have made this transition and we have made a lot of progress over the last 16 years. 
but it's never good when the Cheshire Cat pops up. Because with the Cheshire Cat means Alice is coming. And Lewis Carroll is misquoted as saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. While we have made progress over the last 16 years, that progress is down a road that will not get us to the digital future. There are some fundamental flaws in what we've done. And if we do not take this opportunity to look up and change our perspective, well, we will certainly get somewhere and we'll spend a long time getting there. But at the end, we won't be at the destination that we want or at the destination that society needs us to be. So let's begin. And as we know, all good engineering starts in the solution space, right? All right, if you guys are going to let me get away with that, if you guys are sarcasm impaired, this is not going to go well for either of us. All good, all good engineering, system and otherwise, begins in the problem space. And it's worth noting that the problem space for engineering and systems engineering has changed. It begins, by the way, with the digital revolution. The digital revolution is not only an enabler, but it's part of the problem. It has brought untold complexity to the solutions that we have the ability to deliver. The world is better with software. The world was a lot easier before software. Okay? But that's not the only revolution. If you talk to futurists, they will agree that there are four primary revolutions going on simultaneously. There's the digital revolution that we are, are very aware of. There is the energy renewable revolution that is changing the way that we power our lives. There's the environmental revolution, which is closely coupled to the energy revolution. And there's mass urbanization. And the intersection of these four is leading to unprecedented societal change. It is also leading to unprecedented complexity. Now, some of that was always there. It turns out there's not new complexity in the world. What has changed is our ability to perceive it. The other thing that has changed is the complexity in the man-made systems, what we're doing to intervene in the world. And so, in the English language, we are often very casual about the difference between complicated and complex. We will use the two words interchangeably. And in casual conversation, that may be okay, but in engineering dialogue, we need to be more careful. We used to live in a world of complicated, and in the world of complicated, you can break a problem down into its piece parts, and there's very low coupling between the pieces. So you deliver each of the pieces, they come together, they fit nicely, you've got a solution, all is good. In a complex world, if you try to break the problem down into neat little pieces, you find that there's very high coupling between the pieces. It's all about the interrelationships. That's what distinguishes complexity, and that's certainly where we live. So how do we move forward? Well, we have to recognize that if you live in a complex world, you cannot deliver any part of the solution without at least a rudimentary understanding of the whole. It is our job as systems engineers to ensure that the engineering team, the team that is seeking to understand this complex world and seeking to deliver interventions in a positive way, has that rudimentary understanding. We have to understand the interrelationships. This shift from complicated to complex, driven in large part by those four revolutions, is key because our problem space for model-based and our problem space for systems engineering has changed and it's not going back. Okay, so there is evolution of MBSC. It's worth noting the progress that we've made because we should build upon that progress. As Ad said, models are not new. Models are fundamental to the way we conceive of and execute engineering. All that has changed is the form of them. Digital models are not new. We have used analytical models in the engineering of systems for as long as we've had computing power. So there's a good basis of modeling and simulation to build upon. What is new is new options, new flexibility for representing the descriptive architecture, for painting the big picture 
of problem and solution, of showing how requirements and behavior and physical architecture and test and risk and all these concepts interrelate. That's what's new and that's what we've focused on and obsessed about for the last 16 years. What we're doing is we're trying to move from ambiguity to digital clarity. I always use the analogy of systems engineering as the technical connective tissue for the project. A key precept of systems engineering is you will do a better job of understanding the problem, delivering the right solution, and avoiding negative emergence, unintended consequences, if you look at the problem and solution from multiple perspectives. The problem is, when you do that, each perspective tends to speak a different language. So someone, something has to bind them together. And in engineering at a technical level, that is systems engineering. So the systems engineer, we may not be the most important people on a project, but we are at the center of the project, and we serve as the translator. We translate concepts, we translate words, we translate ideas, so that the team can come to a common understanding, they can bring their insights, and they can bring their analytics. In the old days, the best communication mechanism that we had to achieve that shared understanding was the written specification, the written word. The problem is the written word is ambiguous. And so if we're going to connect in a complex world where interrelationships are key, we'd like to do that in a higher fidelity way. We'd like to do that in digital, and we've chosen to call that model-based. So if you can only spell MBSC, and MBSC is this really daunting thing, or if you classify yourself somewhere on the maturation expertise scale, it's still worth understanding these concepts. Model-based is not the transformation that we've made it out to be. And if we had understood this 16 years ago, if we'd communicated more simply, we would have been further along. Model-based is actually a very natural evolution as we move from low fidelity representations to higher fidelity representations of knowledge. And guess what? That's a continuous journey. We can do it better tomorrow than we can do today. We're just improving the fidelity so that we can communicate better, we can analyze better. Now, in doing so, we can manage the knowledge better, we can analyze better, we can learn better. As engineers, we want to talk about analysis first. As systems engineers, we have to talk about communication first. Because if we're not that connective tissue, then we have failed the project team. You can take everything else here. I do think it is evolutionary in nature, but if we do it right, you have the ability to deliver transformative results. And teams who are applying model-based systems engineering today are seeing some of those benefits. You are seeing the so-called authoritative source of truth. So rather than having a, st a stack of inconsistent documents where nobody knows where to go to for information, everybody can go to either a repository or an interlinked set of repositories to get the authoritative information about a project. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to lay your hands on the true knowledge as opposed to guessing. We spend too, far too much time guessing. There are two parts of systems engineering. There's systems and there's engineering. Systems is about the holism. It's the big picture. It is the descriptive architecture. It is the one chance in the program to get your hands around complexity and your one chance in the program to, to define system level characteristics. Security does not exist at the component level. It is a system level characteristic. But if you're just living in the descriptive architecture world and you're just thinking loose thoughts, you're doing systems thinking, which has value, but you need the rigor of engineering, and that's the analytics on the other side. Those are the models that we've been trained in as discipline engineers. They're the fluid models, the power models, the high fidelity models, generally physics-based. And model-based systems engineering done well allows us to connect the holistic aspect of systems and the rigor aspect of engineering to better deliver capabilities. Because it turns out those analytical models connect off of the descriptive model. Much as the systems engineer is the technical connective tissue, the descriptive model is the technical connective tissue at a digital layer. We can do this today. We are also starting to move 
to the age of composability. We speak of it most frequently in systems of systems, where you're trying to look at how do you bring existing systems together to deliver new capability. But in doing so, what we're really trying to do is change the paradigm that says I have to engineer a new capability from the top down, from the first level of concept all the way down to the atomic level and build things new. We don't have that luxury anymore. We don't have the time, we don't have the money, we know that. So we're trying to figure out how can I reasonably compose systems out of existing pieces and deliver the emergent characteristics I want without error. One of the ways that we're trying to do that is by integrating, by using composability of models. Okay? By the way, most people who speak of composability, myself included, don't really know what it means. Because it requires a different science of integration than the integration that we're used to. Integrating things that weren't designed to come together is different than the integration that we do in systems engineering historically. So we've made progress. But here's the Cheshire Cat moment. It's time for the reality check. It's time for us to look seriously at where we are, what we've done, and where we're trying to get to. If you go back to a complicated world, this is the way a product lifecycle management tool, a product lifecycle manager, would characterize the information. They often refer to what's called RFLP, requirements, functional, logical, physical, and then they track information through life because they need to track a, a specific automobile, a specific plane, a specific plant into the field in its variants. Now, this was a waterfall mentality. You can do complicated problems in a waterfall mentality, and you can do them when the rate of change is slow, and when the rate of technology insertion is low. This does actually work. Freeze your requirements, understand it fully, use paper to communicate across the air gaps. This worked. But what McChrystal pointed out in Team of Teams is you cannot take old problems, throw technology at them, and believe that you're going to get new solutions free of unintended consequences. 1970s, air travel, they started to bring more digital capability into the cockpits. It should make things safer. Air fatalities went up, not down. This story is told over and over and over again, and the reason is the technology that we count on solving the problems, on taking us to the next level, brings complexity in and of itself. And so in large part, what we have done with model-based systems engineering today is we've taken a complicated world, we've brought digitalization, we've tried to say it'll solve a complex problem, and it turns out that the solution is becoming part of the problem. If you had an automobile, we're all engineers here, and I asked you, how are you going to bring this automobile together? Well, clearly, there's going to be a motor and there's going to be a tire. Actually, there will be four tires, hopefully. And you'll bring those together and that's going to deliver you the capability that you want. That makes complete sense. But would you ever bring that motor and those tires together on that car and think it's going to do anything positive for you? None of us would do that. That's absolutely insane. But what we're trying to do in model-based systems engineering today is exactly that. I'm trying to take a model that was built for one purpose, a model that was built for another purpose, bring them together and think that somehow it's going to make my world better. We are forgetting our fundamental precepts of systems engineering in the context of our own tool set. Our processes, methods, and tools have to evolve. In the way people think of this is they like to think of model chains now as this really strong set of linkages. But the reality is when people speak of model chains, they're held together with bubble gum, duct tape, and bailing wire. You're lucky if they work, and if they work, they're likely to give you the wrong answers. 
Again, we understand this because they were not designed to come together. I will give you a phrase to be aware of. Whenever somebody uses the phrase, and you hear it quite a bit today, of integrating models, remember, they don't mean integrating in the way we mean in terms of things that were intended to come together. They mean assembly. And we know as systems engineers that if you bring things together that weren't designed to work together, the odds are you're not going to get the outcomes you want. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the things that my father taught me was the law of conservation of engineering, of systems engineering. Once you've set the problem, the amount of systems engineering required to solve that problem is fixed. More complex requires more, less complex, less. Precedented, less, unprecedented, more. But once you fix the problem, the amount of systems engineering required to deliver a solution successfully is fixed. You just get to choose where you do it. Up front, where it's high leverage, or at assembly, integration, and test, where it's very expensive and it may not work. Let's apply this to ourselves. Let's apply this to model-based systems engineering. Let's apply it to model-based systems engineering in the age of complexity. Which brings us to the pivot point. This is where the Cheshire cat has us. And we have to decide where are we truly going. If you try to digitize, digitalize, that set of silos that we talked about from product lifecycle management, should we be systems engineering? What we have done over the last 16 years is we have looked inward at ourselves. And we have said, how can we better use digital technology to accelerate our processes, methods, and tools? It's a very reasonable thing to do. And in doing so, we have developed toolkits and technologies and representations that effectively build a wall around us. Because if you take a classic systems engineering notation today and put it in front of a stakeholder, either their eyes are going to roll back in their head or they're going to throw you out of their office. Okay? That may work for a normal engineer, but a systems engineer has to communicate. So what we have done is we have looked inward. We have become reductionist in our pursuit of holism. That can't work. That works fine for mechanicals and electricals. We need them to be that. But we have forgotten ourselves in this obsession with our own processes, methods, and tools driven by model-based. So should we be systems engineering or should we be engineering systems? Sounds like a little semantic game. It's a play of a flip of words. I thought so too up until about 18 months ago. It turns out about five to eight years ago, there was an interesting, only interesting to engineers, by the way, but an interesting debate that was running around in Nkosi. And it was, should we be talking about systems engineering or engineering systems? The only people who were using the engineering systems language was MIT. Well, MIT likes to be different than anybody else, so we just thought they were playing a semantic game. I've come to realize they weren't. What they were trying to communicate, and what I wasn't understanding, is perspective. We as systems engineers may have our own processes, methods, and tools, but it always has to be in the holistic pursuit of delivering the capability the customer needs. That means that we cannot look inward. We cannot stare at our own shoes and make progress. We must look outward. We must look at the engineering life cycle. It is not about digitalization of us. It is about digitalization of engineering. It is about unifying design, not separating it. It is about bringing the team together in a collaborative, concurrent manner, not doing our job better so that we can throw it over the fence in a digital format. This is an old chart. It was done by the uh, U.S. National Defense Industry Association in 2011. In that day, they called it model-based engineering. We would now call it digital thread or digital twin or digital engineering. It doesn't really matter. But it is the digitalization of the engineering lifecycle. 
This is where we have the opportunity to make radical advances in time to market, in cost, and in quality. Because we're not dealing with independent silos and handing the product across. We're trying to connect the silos. This is the context that we have to live in to deliver the digital future. This is the context that we have to live in to address complexity because we have to honor the interrelationships, not ignore them. And this is where the Incozy roadmap broke. This is an old chart. This is about a 2010 chart. I think the first variant was around 2007. It was Incozy's roadmap for the model-based systems engineering vision. In 2015, when I delivered a keynote for the Incozy International Symposium, about uh, 21st century systems engineering, building tomorrow's systems. I noted the discontinuity on this chart. And it's, it's really clear. As engineers, we knew it was here. What we were trying to do down here early was to mature our methods. But up here, we were going to define our theory, ontology, and formalisms. Hold on. What are you building your methods on if you don't have theory, ontology, and formalisms? We had the steps out of order. And we knew we had the steps out of order, and it was an issue of making practical progress. The problem is, when you do it out of order, these things eventually break. I warned us then that the, that, that the discontinuity was coming. I didn't realize how quickly it was coming, because it's here. When you talk about digital engineering, when you talk about connecting the engineering life cycle, you have to have these things. This bit alone, drawing a lot of pictures, no matter how good they are, will not get you across the gap. For those who track SysML, that's one of the fundamental precepts in SysML 2.0. That's one of the things that they are fundamentally trying to solve because they understand that SysML 1 and SysML 1.6 will not do this. There are other things, by the way, about communication, about the fact that we have to be able to communicate to other engineers and business people. But the biggest thing is, unless we get here, and I don't use the dreaded O word anymore, I'm going to talk about meta model instead. Unless we do that, we cannot connect the disciplines the way we have to. We're at the discontinuity. So let's use the meta model term as opposed to the dreaded O word. What's the difference? Well, let's go back to CAD for a second, because that's real easy to understand. A drawing of a plane here, I think it's a hawker, top, front, side. I could draw that, well, actually I couldn't draw it, but somebody could draw that in Visio. But it wouldn't have any meaning, because you cannot take that to an automated manufacturing process or anything else. You're likely having inconsistencies and other things like that. So instead, you don't draw it in Visio. You draw it in a true CAD tool. And what's the difference? On the screen, it may look exactly the same. You may be looking at a graphic that helps you understand, but underlying it, the information model is very simple. It's points and vectors, okay? That's all it takes to describe geometry for CAD, is points and vectors. So the question is, are you drawing top, front, and side, or under the covers, is there a series of points and vectors that you can pass on to manufacturing? Right now, in large part, our industry in model-based systems engineering has been drawing our variant to top front side, and we need to move to our variant to points and vectors. That's the information model. That's the meta model. What does that mean for us? It means something like this. These are words that you should be familiar with, at least a subset of them. Requirements, functions, items, states, modes, verification, Risk, concerns, these aren't new concepts. They're in 15.288. They're in the Incozy handbook. What's different is in going model-based, bringing the discipline to understand the interrelationships between them. How are they truly interrelated? What does the interrelationship mean? Because there are often multiple between two types of information. Okay. There is an information model which underpins systems engineering, or more importantly, underpins the engineering of systems. 
if we are to connect the engineering silos, we have to understand this information model. Doesn't mean that we have to show things in a data representation all the time. We can still use our pictures, but we have to understand this. And in doing so, we advance our discipline. Now, it turns out that this information model, this meta model, is far more than diagrams. Diagrams may tell us how to represent it from different perspectives, but diagrams are representations of information, not the information itself. It's more than just a data dictionary, because it's the interrelationships between these ideas that are key. It's, it's how is that requirement manifested in behavior? How is that behavior allocated to the physical architecture? It's more than just the capture of the information. If we have a meta model, if we have an information model, then we can move from what we know to what we don't. We can see what is missing. What haven't we thought of? Have we really done a good job of risk identification? Have we really studied those dimensions? It is more than the specification. Most of what we're doing in systems engineering right now, at least in model-based, is obsessed about capturing the outcome so that we can hand it off to the next part of the life cycle. Necessary, not sufficient. We have to capture the journey. How did I get there? How did I move from those requirements to that logical architecture, to that physical architecture? What assumptions did I make? What alternatives did I consider? What decision did I make and why? And this is critical for multiple reasons. One is, if I leave the program and somebody else comes along, if they only have the specification, they have to re-engineer why I did what I did. Not very effective because one, it's costly, and two, they're gonna get it wrong. Two, if I show my thinking, then I expose my thinking to the rest of the project team and they can say, uh -uh -uh, that's dumb. I'll tell you what, I don't like to be told that, but I would rather be told that today than embed it in my design and watch it fail two years from now. And then more than anything else, it's the why of the design that equips you for change. Because if you understood why you did things, what you considered, then when a new requirement comes down or when a new technology is introduced, you can consider rationally how to insert it into your system. The thinking has already been done, and you have to do variants on the thinking in large part. And last, it's more than the system of interest. It's also about engineering our engineering enterprise. So these are all aspects of the meta model, the information model. It's more than this, but you start to get the idea there is an information model that underpins us. We have to be explicit about it. Now, in doing so, we have to recognize scope. Again, we've been staring at our own feet for 16 years. Let's pull our eyes up and let's remember what we're about. We're about connecting the greater project team, which I hate to say it has non-engineers in it. We have to talk to those people. I know they're scary. We can do it. We have to respect them because if not, we will deliver systems that don't meet their needs. We may meet the requirements, but it's completely unusable. More likely, we're gonna miss the requirements because we did not communicate effectively with the stakeholder and the customer. These visualizations that we love today would make Edward Tufte spin in his grave if he were dead. They are horrific. They are absolutely awful. Their communication content is poor and we rationalize that. We can do better than that. We can go to the gaming industry, we can go to Hollywood, and we can take this meta model, and instead of trying to walk somebody through a series of static diagrams to tell them what it'll be like, why not drop them in an immersive environment? The technology exists, but only if we move beyond static diagrams. And by the way, there's a bigger scope here, and it's about people, it's about workflow. The scariest word on this list is trust. Again, it's a human concept. Engineers don't like to deal with humans. I know I am one. The problem with trust, particularly in model-based, is twofold. One is, no offense to you, I don't trust your model because I don't know it well enough. 
If it comes in a library, if it comes off a shelf, if I don't know you and you very, very well, the chance that I'm going to use that is zero. And the other thing is, no disrespect to you, I don't trust you with my model. Because unless I know you as an engineer, I don't trust that you're going to keep it within its bounds of validity. And you may misuse it and deliver a bad consequence, and I can't have that. And so somehow we've got to get beyond this issue. And we get beyond this issue by recognizing there's more information that we have to share rather than just thinking that people are going to pick up model parts off the shelf, assemble them, and, and go on their merry way. That's not true. We have to think through some of the sociology of this. We don't have all the answers. Engineers are the smartest people in the room. Just ask us. We'll tell you. I read an article about this on the plane flight over, so I got it. I don't need you at all. Well, the issues that we're dealing with in knowledge representation, in visualization, in human issues, there are experts in those fields. If we recognize that the problem has changed, if we recognize that it's about complexity, if we recognize that it's about changing the engineering value chain, then we should recognize as good systems engineers that you have to assemble a team of specialists and bring them together in a fit-for-purpose way to solve that problem. These are some of the specialists we need. So where do we go from here? It's a call to action for model-based. It's a call to action for systems engineering. And it's a call to action for engineering as well. Because classical reductionist engineering, the way we have done it for centuries, the way we teach it in schools, has got us here, but it won't get us any further. We do not have to discard reductionism, but we must marry it with holism. The engineering value chain must change, and systems engineering must be part of it. Model based must be part of it. The complexity is there. We have outgrown systems engineering as it stands, outgrown engineering as it stands. It's the scale of problems, it's the supply chain complexity, it's the dynamic complexity. These problems change shape as we try to solve them. Intervention changes the problem. We have to recognize that. Other than that, we will use 20th century approaches for 21st century problems. We will take complicated tools for complicated problems, throw technology at it, and believe that it's fit for purpose for complex. It's not. A system is a system is a system. Incozi realized this about 18 years ago, and we started to move beyond aerospace and defense to medical, to automotive, to transport, to energy, and now we need to turn that lens on ourselves. The enterprise that delivers engineering services that delivers design is a system itself. The system that designs the system can and must be engineered. And in a time of change, it must be re-engineered. The call to action is we must help in that re-engineering. We have to always remember that our job is to connect people, their insights, their ideas, their analyses, so that we can study the problem from multiple multiple dimensions and find the best answer. There is a meta model, there is an information model that underpins the engineering of systems that you do. Move it from the implicit to the explicit. I don't care if you're doing model based or not. Move your information model from the implicit to the explicit. Where do you do that? Well, you can pick up a meta model. Vitex is open source because it's built upon something done by the U.S. Army starting in 68. If you don't like that, go to the Incozi Patterns-Based Model Systems Engineering Working Group. Grab Bill Schindel's S-Star. Whatever you do, don't build your own. Because here's a couple things about meta model design. Again, I recognize we're all engineers, we're smart people, we know how to do this. No, we don't. Okay? Building a good meta model takes years of work, it takes multiple teams, and it takes application across multiple systems. Now you can extend one to your heart's content, but I will tell you, having watched this be done, having been part of it for years, 
that the first meta model that you build is going to be way wrong. <laughs> you don't need to go through that pain. So plagiarize, steal, borrow, I don't care what word you use, but grab somebody else's to start, and whether you're doing model-based or not, move your information model from the implicit to the explicit. That alone moves your engineering efforts forward. It moves your communication forward, moves your knowledge management forward. We are trying to enable collaborative design through life design fully connected in this modern world. That is the end game that we're going for. You can call it digital threads, you can call it digital, digital twin, you can call it digital engineering. All of them have specific nuances. But the key is this. We have a practice that we call systems engineering. Will we choose to apply it to ourselves? Will we choose to apply it to this journey? There's no doubt we're on this journey. Okay, society is not going to go back and intentionally choose to go from the complex to the complicated. So the question is, will it be accidental? I don't think so. Will it be integrated, by which I mean assembled? That's the route that we're on now, and that will fail. Or will it be engineered? The last call to action is for us to engage ourselves in helping to connect the silos to help connect the engineering enterprise, to stop staring at our own feet and return to the holism that is systems engineering. I'll end with two paradoxes or two comments on the digital future. If you want to optimize systems engineering, you sub-optimize systems engineering. What's that mean? Well, optimizing systems engineering means that we look inward and we do things for our own purpose. And we may have great processes, methods, and tools, but we build a silo around ourselves. Sub-optimizing systems engineering means that we remember that we are a component in a bigger system. I know that we don't like to think of ourselves as components, but we are. We're a component in the engineering system that delivers a capability, value in response to a business challenge. And then as Akoff said, we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because, we get, than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. We're smart people. We simply need to start in the problem space and understand what the real need is, the change in complexity, these four revolutions, the change that engineering must make. If we recognize that, if we start in the problem space and we solve the right problem, I have every confidence that we will get to the right solution. Thank you. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions for David? <coughs> Excuse me. Dave, thanks for an interesting presentation. I think you touched on some key issues which I think we're still wrestling with. Um, when we look at the future, um, and it depends on what sort of time horizon we're considering. Perhaps one of the things we need to think about in our meter model is that um, to a large extent it's driven by um, systems as machines. This paradigm or this underlying metaphor is challenged when we get to um, system of systems and we now have to deal with subjective issues. You raised some already right. in an engineering team of trust. Yes. Um, we need to deal with issues of values. We need to deal with um, a whole range of um, subjective issues. And perhaps um, one of the key things um, um, to think about in terms of the meter models mm -hmm. is so how will we incorporate subjective aspects? Or is the model the right place to do this? Um, and, and there's some key questions, I think, there that I've been thinking about um, that we need to think or, or deal with. So the issues of power, the issues of um, ideology, etc. Um, because these are central to integration of higher level systems. Um, they're not important necessarily or significantly important for the integration of small technical systems. Right. No, you're you're absolutely right. I often joke that uh, as an engineer, I entered into a contract when I went to school 
and they promised that I would never have to deal with humans again. And unfortunately, that contract is null and void. We know that. As engineers, we have grown comfortable with the quote-unquote predictability of hardware and software. If you give it one set of inputs, you expect one set of outputs. And we try to avoid that squishy human. Well, it turns out the human in the system, whether it's a system or a system of systems, is critical. We have to figure out, we may not be able to get the same precision, but we should be able to get accuracy. And this is where we need to look beyond the technical disciplines and draw in the socio-disciplines. Engineers have this way of disrespecting anybody who deals over there in those soft sciences. And the reality is, those are sciences. Now, they may work at a population level as opposed to an individual, but they do work. I think the model is the right place to do it. I think it, we're going to have to deal with some stochastic issues as opposed to deterministic issues, but we have to do that anyway. And we have to draw in more than just engineers. We need to do that sooner rather than later. We have to figure out in this digital world, you're right, most of this you're going to read from the lens of the machine that we build. But the machine that we build is completely irrelevant if it doesn't take into account the human that's in it, the human that's using it, or the human that's being impacted by it. We have to up that as well. Henry Green from Alm School. Thank you, David. The most striking thing I found about your presentation is when you cited the quote that most times we, we solve the wrong problems. Right. Now, I, I do some soul searching and ask myself the reason why is probably because we get, we get very comfortable with the deterministic world. I mean, as engineers, we like crisp things. Yes. Those, of us of, those of us who are married probably know this better than anyone else. Because sometimes we get presented with solutions at home, you come with a simple solution. I mean, we present these simple solutions to what our better half think are really complex problems, and we get into deeper trouble. And thinking to ourselves, well, I, I thought I came up with a, with a solution. And we probably, because we're comfortable with certain things we know, we probably, I wonder whether it is that we oversimplify the world to the point of making it simplistic. Um, instead of simplifying so we can find the appropriate solutions. I mean, you mentioned the four revolutions, I think. Um, we're crazy about digitalization. I mean, there's, right. there's no option. But if we think carefully, Elon Musk says, no, it's going to present problems that we haven't even thought of. And this is probably where we need the poets to come in to tell us, you know, what things they foresee are coming. The energy revolution. I mean, you know, we get excited about it, and, and I don't think any person other than plasma physicists and, and engineers know about the ITAR tokamak that's been built in Kajarache and it's been put to use mm -hmm. for control fusion. And, and we don't talk about it. We, nobody, nobody knows, nobody other than ourselves. Um, the environmental issues, um, I think, from an engineering perspective, we could probably think of, of very sassy solutions to those problems, and, and, but nobody else knows about it. We, society is not involved. We don't demystify what we do. And the mass urbanization, we don't have to talk about because, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a royal mess all over. So I'm wondering, you know, how do we, how do we endow engineers with, with, some, with an appreciation of, of, of the soft skills, the poetry that other people understand, you know, these things that are, that are vague and fluffy? Uh, it's, a, it's a great observation. And I once made the comment, the casual comment, that the world is getting more complex. And I was immediately corrected that the world is the world. It's our understanding of the complexity is getting better. So how do we have the, the deeper appreciation of it? I think there are two things. One is, as engineers, we have to recognize that we are as limited by our worldview as anybody else. And so we can get comfortable within our worldview, which may be the technologies that are available, the interactions, the interrelationships, or just, hey, I'm used to solving problems this way. So it begins with a self-awareness that I, like everybody else, have my worldview or my worldviews, which means I have my blind spots. If I can recognize that, then the question is, 
can I surround myself with influences that push me outside of that zone? Because the reality, again, go back to the system's perspective. And part of the system's principle is multiple perspectives are more likely to get you to a truer view of the problem and solution than a singular perspective. Sometimes I can bring that myself. Most often, I need multiple people to do that. So if I've got better self-awareness of my worldview, my blind spots, etc., will I relate to some cutting-edge science in the right field? Will I relate to art and poetry and some things that will, you know, in, awaken that part of my mind? If I can't do it, will I at least be with somebody who can bring it? That's the only only concrete suggestion I can make to to that problem. Be aware of our worldview, our perspective. Thank you very much. I think we should leave the rest of the questions for tea time, please, because we're running out. Thank you very much, David. That was a profoundly important keynote you presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. You were talking about motor cars and engines and tires and so on. I was just warning you about one thing. In the Karoo, there's some guys who live there who've inserted jet engines into their motor cars. And, and they are out for a drive every now and then on the freeway. Be careful. I will be careful. Thank be you, Be careful. Thank you. It is 